Let me start this video by saying, I know many people think that there isn't much of a debate here. If you talk to anyone about the most iconic and influential players in basketball history, Dr. J is probably one of the first names that comes up. John Havlicek, on the other hand, is a respected player from NBA history, but he's not as much of an icon as Dr. J is. I feel that when people try and compare other players to each other nowadays, there's an emphasis on who would beat the other in a game of one-on-one. -on -one. I'll get this out of the way right now. I think Dr. J was a better athlete than John Havlicek, but my main question with this video is, who was the greater player? Also, before I start, I should address some elephants in the room. Dr. J played in both the ABA and the NBA, while Havlicek only played in the NBA, but for his first few seasons in the league, he was a sixth man off the bench. In regards to Havlicek, by 1968 he was averaging 35.6 minutes per game, and even before that, he was still receiving just below or upwards of 30 minutes a game, and it wasn't uncommon for those minutes to increase in the postseason. But the bigger conundrum is, do I count Dr. J's ABA achievements or not? Well, whichever choice I go with is sure to make somebody upset, but yeah, I am going to acknowledge the ABA achievements, with a grain of salt approach. I'll elaborate more as the video goes on, but doing it this way was a lot more interesting than if I had ignored the ABA completely. With that out of the way, let's look at Dr. J and Havlicek's player profiles and accolades. Julius Irving was 6'7 and spent his entire career playing as a small forward. He played with the Virginia Squires for two seasons, the New York Nets for three seasons, and finally the Philadelphia 76ers for 11 seasons. Dr. J was the 1981 NBA MVP, an 11-time NBA All-Star, he made 7 All-NBA teams, was a 2-time All-Star Game MVP, and won a championship in 1983. He won three straight ABA MVPs in 1974, 75, 76, he won two championships in 74 and 76, and was the playoff MVP both years, was a five-time ABA All-Star, made five All-ABA teams, and was recognized as the ABA's all-time MVP in 1997. John Havlicek was 6'5". He was a natural shooting guard and started his career out that way, but by the late 60s and 70s, he was more often than not a small forward. Hondo spent his entire career with the Boston Celtics. He was an 8-time NBA champion, the 1974 Finals MVP, a 13-time All-Star, he made 11 All-NBA teams, and 8 All-Defense teams. He never won a regular season MVP, but he finished in 4th place in 72, and 5th place in 73. Now that we know some of their career accolades, let's compare the two in 5 major categories. Categories. Round 1 is scoring. Dr. J scored 18,364 points in the NBA and 11,662 points in the ABA for a combined career total of 30,026. He had a career average of 24.2 points per game. J won three ABA scoring titles in 1973, 74, and 76, with his best average coming in 73, with 31.9 points per game. His single game record in the ABA was 63 points. In the NBA, J's highest scoring average in a season was a 1980 with 26.9 points per game, and his single game record was 45 points. Simply put, Dr. J is one of, if not the greatest finisher in basketball history. Despite his skinny appearance, J was one of the most powerful dunkers the game has ever seen. With a 43 inch vertical and the speed of a cheetah, once he was in the air there was almost nothing you could do to stop him. If you put two guys on him, he was going to dunk over both of them. If you put three guys on him, he was going to blow right past them. I once heard someone describe Dr. J as the man who made the fast break fast, and honestly, I kind of like that. J was so athletic that when he got a steal and initiated a fast break, he could bust out some crazy move on the fly, even with guys chasing him down. That's just how built into his DNA basketball was. Everybody knew the ball was going to go to Dr. J on the fast break, yet they still couldn't stop him. Sometimes he didn't even need a running start. J could just catch the ball, turn, rise up, and slam. But if he couldn't finish the dunk, J was more than happy to settle for a layup. The doctor's hang time and control was out of this world. Heck, I used one of his most famous plays as part of my intro. His leaping ability also made him pretty good at getting offensive rebounds and putting up second chance points, though he was better at this in the ABA than the NBA. In 1972, he led the ABA in total offensive rebounds. While he could score from the mid-range, his jumper was inconsistent, so more often than not, Jay was looking to drive to the rim or get the ball in the paint or on the block. Fun fact, he actually made the first three-pointer in NBA Finals history. While he was a great scorer in the ABA, Dr. J's numbers took a dip when he joined the NBA. The main cause of this may have been that the NBA was much stronger in terms of big men and rim protectors than the ABA was. Also, people say that Dr. J was suffering from knee injuries throughout his NBA career, though besides an article from 1974 when he was still in the ABA, I personally haven't been able to find a lot of concrete evidence to back that claim up. Even if he was injured, it wasn't like he was missing an absurd amount of games. A more reasonable 
plausible explanation could be that Jay saw a big role change going from the ABA to the NBA. In the ABA, he was the guy. The first option, the franchise player, the league player. But that first NBA season with the Sixers was unlike anything Jay had been through. The 77 Sixers were stacked with talent, and there was a ton of drama behind the scenes about guys fighting over who was or wasn't getting minutes. Dr. Jay was a famously likable guy who did anything he could to avoid conflict, so he just kind of accepted a new role where he wouldn't score as much, at least in the regular season. John Havlicek scored 26,395 points over 16 seasons. He had a career average of 20.8 points per game, and while he never won a scoring title, he finished as the runner-up in 1971, with 28.9 points per game. The highest he ever scored in a single game was 43 points, which he did twice, once in 1963 and once in 1970. As I previously mentioned, Havlicek wasn't as athletic as Dr. J, but he could get up there every now and then, and could show off some mid-air theatrics, like this shot he pulled off in the 1964 Finals. Havlicek was a fierce competitor, who left everything out on the court. He was actually born with larger lungs than most people, which meant he very rarely got tired. He led the NBA in minutes played twice. Havlicek would even tell teammates, You're only as tired as you think you are. So when you couple that with the hustle mindset he had, Havlicek was a perfect piece for the Celtics' trademark fast-break offense. Sometimes he was on the receiving end of an outlet pass, but he could also initiate the play himself and drive through guys to get to the rim. Hondo's main style of play, however, was as a jump shooter. Like many guys in the NBA now, Havlicek was deadly when he got a screen from his teammate, and he did a lot of off-the-dribble scoring. Like Jerry West, Honda was able to pull up right in the face of defenders, or when he was in traffic and covered by guys, he could twist and contort his body to throw up a shot. And although he never got to play with a three-point line, there are clips where he appears to be shooting from that range. I think if he did have it, he would have made for an excellent catch-and-shoot guy from the corner. He was able to get shots off before defenses had settled, and because of his relatively small size, he was able to slip past guys and cut to the basket. That's another great part of his game, his off-ball movement. This is a tough call, but because of his versatility, I'm actually gonna side with Hondo. Dr. J may have been the more skilled scorer, but Hondo was a bigger threat in more areas. The winner of round one is John Havlicek. Round two is efficiency. In his NBA career, Dr. J shot 50.7% and 50.4% from the field in the ABA. He only ever shot below 49% for an entire season twice, the final two seasons of his career. When you're mostly scoring layups and shooting close to the basket, it usually results in high shooting percentages. But still, a non-center converting at a high rate around the rim like that is extremely valuable to a team. While Dr. J did not take many threes, over the course of his ABA career, he averaged 32.2% from that distance and got as high 39.5% in 1974. In the NBA, he averaged 26.1% from three and only shot 30% in one season, which was 1984. For his career, John Havlicek shot 43.9% from the field. He never shot higher than 50% for an entire season. The closest he got was 46.4% in 1970. But you've got to consider that Havlicek did much more outside shooting than Dr. J did. And between the two, Havlicek was definitely the better free throw shooter. For his career, Hondo shot 81.5% from the charity stripe, while Jay shot 77.7%. When you factor that in, now Havlicek has 8 seasons where he had a true shooting percentage of 50 or higher. But when you look at Dr. J's numbers, he shot higher than the league average every season of his career, besides 1986 and 87. I think this category is much easier to call. The winner of round two is Julius Irving. Round three is defense. Dr. J averaged two steals and 1.7 blocks over the course of his career, getting as high as 2.5 steals and 2.4 blocks in the ABA, and 2.2 steals and 1.8 blocks in the NBA. His only all-defense appearance was in 1976, where he was named to the first team. Much like scoring, Jay's best defensive years were in the ABA. His high leaping abilities made him a great shot blocker, and he had good anticipation skills that allowed him to jump into passing lanes and rack up steals. I wouldn't call Dr. J a bad defender in the NBA, he was still a good pickpocket and help defender, but it was also more common for Dr. J to get trapped in switches and lose his man. By J's own admission, he did take a bit of a backseat on defense once the team acquired Bobby Jones, which is understandable. Of the eight all-defense teams John Havlicek made throughout his career, five of them were first-team selections. He averaged 1.2 steals and 0.3 blocks, but those statistics weren't even tracked until the 73-74 season, so we can only speculate what he would have averaged in his prime. While he wasn't the highest leaper or the fastest sprinter, Hondo had excellent timing and a high basketball IQ that allowed him to block and contest jump shots of guys who were taller than he was. Havlicek wasn't one of those guys who only focused on the offensive side of the game. He would play 
hounding defense throughout the entire regulation, constantly hand-checking guys and forcing drivers to shoot the harder jump shots instead of getting a look at the rim. He was also tenacious with his full-court presses, something both Red Auerbach and Tom Heinsohn had the Celtics do. In his younger years, he mostly contained the opposing team's ball handlers, but as his career progressed, Havlicek also turned into a great post defender, making him a threat to the 1, 2, 3, or 4. Because of his quick hands, he could make dribbling with your back to the basket uncomfortable, or worse, result in a turnover. If there's one thing Havlicek is remembered for, it's his famous steal in Game 7 of the 1965 East Finals, one of the greatest moments in NBA history. In Havlicek's words, he thought that the best players could see the game of basketball in slow motion. Whether he really did, I guess we'll never know. But it would explain his defensive abilities. For me, I think Hondo comfortably takes this one. The winner of round 3 is John Havlicek. Round 4 is Peak, and this is probably the most difficult category for me to judge. Unlike my last versus video between Jerry West and Oscar Robertson, this time, I'm going to classify Peak as the player's three best seasons. Dr. J's peak was from 1974 to 76, when he racked up most of his impressive accolades and averaged 28.2 points, 10.9 rebounds, and 5.2 assists on 50.8% shooting from the field. I said it briefly in round one, but during his ABA days, Dr. J was a fantastic rebounder, and if you want to go back further, he was an even better rebounder in college. In his first five ABA seasons, he averaged double-digit rebounds, but when he joined the NBA, he never averaged nine. But again, the NBA was much more about the big men than the ABA was. On average, players were shorter in the ABA, so it only made sense for a super athletic 6'7 guy to grab a ton of rebounds for his team. I can understand why someone might not want to compare an ABA player to an NBA player. The styles were very different. There have been tons of debates over which league had the stronger players, but that's not something I really want to dive into here. To appease both sides, I'm going to mention Dr. J's NBA peak as well, which was from 1980 to 82, when he averaged 25.3 points 7.4 rebounds, and 4.3 assists. John Havlicek's peak was from 1971 to 73, when he averaged 26.7 points, 8.1 rebounds, and 7.2 assists. Something I haven't mentioned yet was Havlicek's ability as a playmaker. That was another area of the game Honda was better at than Dr. J. While he didn't bust out behind the back moves, Havlicek had good control of the ball and excellent court vision, which led to him thriving as a point forward. During those three years, Havlicek had 18 total triple doubles, even leading the league in 1972, and before that in 1972. For the record, Dr. J only secured one triple-double from 1980 to 82, and when you consider that Havlicek was just 6'5 and playing in the league where centers ran the game, his rebounding numbers look even more impressive. I once read somewhere that Havlicek was not a fan of the three-point line, because he thought it made players work less. In 1973, the Celtics won 68 games, which is still a personal best in franchise history. Havlicek's teammate Dave Cowens was chosen as that season's MVP, but I would argue that Havlicek was the real MVP. Besides rebounding, Havlicek had the better numbers and major and advanced stats, and unlike Cowens, Havlicek was first team all defense. At this time, the NBA players voted for the MVP, but considering Havlicek was voted first team all NBA and Cowens was voted second team, I have a feeling the media would have voted Havlicek for MVP in 1973, but that is just a hypothetical. Even though Havlicek didn't lead the Celtics to the finals during his individual peak, I would also argue that if he hadn't gotten injured in the 1973 East Finals, he could have done it, but again, that's another hypothetical. This is where things become really tricky. I'm gonna be honest, I'm 51% to 49% between these two, but if I had to choose who I would want to play a game for me at their absolute peak, I think I would go with Jay. But I'd love to hear who you would take at their peak, because this is the most debatable category in this comparison. The winner of round 4 is Julius Irving. Round 5 is Playoffs. Dr. J made the playoffs every season of his career and played in 189 total playoff games. 141 of those were in the NBA and 48 were in the ABA. He made six finals, four in the NBA and two in the ABA, won two ABA championships, and had career playoff averages of 24.2 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 4.4 assists. But this is another case where his ABA numbers really help out his career average. In those five seasons with the Squires and Nets, J averaged 31.1 points, 12.9 rebounds, 
and 5.1 assists, he led the playoffs in scoring four times and rebounding once. But just going by NBA, Dr. J averaged 21.9 points, 7 rebounds, and 4.4 assists in the playoffs. The highlight of Dr. J's playoff career was his performance in the 1976 ABA Finals against a Denver Nuggets team with Hall of Famers David Thompson, Dan Issel, and one of, if not the greatest defender of his generation, Bobby Jones. Dr. J had one of the most dominant stretches of play, regardless of what league it was. In Game 1, he scored 45 points and grabbed 12 rebounds. He scored 18 of his team's final 22 points, including a buzzer-beating shot to win the game. In Game 2, he scored 48 points, including 25 in the fourth quarter. Game 3, 31 points and 12 rebounds. Game 4, 34 points and 15 rebounds. Game 5, 37 and 15. Game 6, 31, 19, 5 steals, and 4 blocks. Insane. The closest Dr. J ever came to reaching those same heights in the NBA was the 1977 postseason, where he averaged 27.3 points, 6.4 rebounds, and 4.5 assists, leading all players in points and win shares. In the finals, he posted an even better 30.3 points, 6.8 rebounds, and 5 assists. But even though the Sixers were the favorites in that finals, and had taken a 2-0 series lead, the Blazers won the next four straight to capture the 1977 championship. The reasons for the Sixers' collapse have been debated about for years. Whatever you believe, it's hard to pin Philly's failure on Dr. J. But this series would start a trend of him ultimately coming up short in the NBA. In 1978, the Sixers won 55 games but lost to the 44-win Bullets in the East Finals. In the 1979 East Semis, the Sixers lost to the Spurs in 7. In 1980, the Sixers lost to the Lakers in the Finals. In 1981, the Sixers blew a 3-1 series lead to the Celtics as the runner-up in MVP voting, Larry Bird, outplayed Dr. Dr. J. And in 1982, the Sixers once again lost to the Lakers in the finals, though Dr. J did lead all postseason players in points and win shares. In 1983, the Sixers got revenge, but at that point, Moses Malone had taken over as the team's best player. In 1984, the Sixers lost in the first round to the New Jersey Nets. In 1985, they lost to the Celtics in the East Finals. And in 1986, the Sixers lost in seven games to the Milwaukee Bucks. Game seven was decided by a single point, and it it was Dr. J who missed the final go-ahead shot that could have won Philly the game. John Havlicek made the playoffs 13 times in his career, and played a total of 172 postseason games. He made the finals 8 times, and won a championship in each of those appearances to give himself a perfect 8-0 record. He had playoff averages of 22 points, 6.9 rebounds, and 4.8 assists. Remember when I said I use a Dr. J clip in my intro? Well, I also use a Havlicek one. Honda was one of the clutchest playoff performers of all time. I already mentioned, Havlicek stole the ball! But he also has his Game 5 performance in the 1976 Finals, when he was 36 years old and playing on a bad foot, but he still managed to be the best all-around player and hit this iconic shot. He had multiple clutch shots in Game 6 of the 74 Finals, which would've won the Celtics the game, if not for Kareem's last second hook shot. And in Game 5 of the 1973 East Finals, Havlicek was forced to shoot with his left hand after a right shoulder injury, but somehow, he still managed to score 18 points and shoot 75% from the field. Some people might bring up the fact that Havlicek won most of his rings alongside Bill Russell on a well-built Celtics team, and he was a sixth man for the majority of them. In the 1964, 65, and 66 Finals, he was their second highest scorer, and in 66, he was their second highest rebounder as well. That's not just a guy who was along for the ride. He was a key piece for those championship teams. But by 1968 and 69, he was definitely a starter, and had taken over as the Celtics' best player. If the finals MVP had existed at the time, I believe Havlicek could have won it in 1968, with his averages of 27.3 points, 8.7 rebounds, and 6.7 assists. But even before that, he was the driving force behind the Celtics' 3-1 series comeback against the Sixers in the 1968 East Finals, where he put up 25.6 points, 9.3 rebounds, and 8.6 assists. He led all players that postseason in points, as well as assists. Famously, Jerry West won the first ever Finals MVP in 1969, even though the Lakers lost the series. But if the award was given to a player on the winning team, like it has in every final since, Havlicek definitely could have won that as well, since he averaged 28.3 points, 11 rebounds, and 4.4 assists, while playing every single minute of the series. 
Even in the Celtics' only playoff loss of the decade, the 1967 East Finals, Havlicek still led the team with 30 points, 9 rebounds, and 2.8 assists. Now, to be fair, Havlicek did struggle to lead the Celtics back to the finals in the early 70s. They finally made it back in 1972, and in the 73 East semis against the Hawks, Hondo scored 54 points in Game 1, the most points ever scored by a Celtic in a playoff game. But then Havlicek got injured. Like I said earlier, Havlicek won the 1974 championship, and then the 1976 championship. Which brings us to the only time Dr. J and Havlicek played against each other in a series, the 1977 East Semis. As a 37-year-old, Havlicek held his own pretty well against a prime Dr. J. For the series, J averaged 23.7 points, 6.1 rebounds, and 2.7 assists, while Havlicek averaged 19.9 points, 5.7 rebounds, and 6.7 assists. This was a very entertaining series that went to seven games, but the Sixers ultimately won. In the NBA, Dr. J only had one playoff game where he scored 40 points. Havlicek had five 40-point games. If you care more about peak-for-peak peak playoff performance, then Dr. J does have an argument. But because of how much more consistent he was, for me, the winner of round five is John Havlicek, which means, in my humble opinion, Havlicek was the greater player. So, what do you think? Am I wrong? Do you agree with me? Did I leave out anything about these two legends? Let me know in the comments, and I hope you have a good day. Take care.